Hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to Triple N Media I am Dr Nick Nickam I have been a cardiologist for more than 40 years in the Houston area the focus of this presentation is on ACC AHA 2022 heart failure stages based on structure based on their anatomy based on their function and based on their symptomatology so there are various classifications so we're going to learn all these and much more so let us uh, continue with the feature presentation the stages a b c d are based on the symptoms and also the structure of the heart stage 1 is uh, consisting of a, a population that is at risk for developing heart failure in the future but at the current time they have no symptoms there is no structural heart disease as such and their biomarkers are normal these may be patients with history of hypertension metabolic syndrome obesity well let's move to stage b i have color coded this so i will get a better understanding of what these different stages mean stage b is the pre heart failure stage that these patients do not have any symptoms but if you look at the long list here you realize these patients are already having some structural changes in their heart and the cardiovascular system there are structural uh, changes in the heart there is reduced right or the left ventricular systolic function as reflected in the ejection fraction and there could be some strain which can be detected on echocardiography some patients may have like left ventricular hypertrophy some patients may have cardiac enlargement there may be some wall motion abnormalities related to either coronary artery disease or infiltrate your kind of uh, cardiomyopathies some patients may have valvular heart disease and some patients may have increased filling pressures a lot of this information can be obtained from a simple transthoracic echocardiography and some patients may have elevated bnp or elevated unexplained levels of troponin elevated troponins in the absence of uh, renal failure or other conditions like myocarditis etc we when we get to stage stage b we are already dealing with the structural and also functional changes in the heart itself having effect on other organs as time goes on now stage c is structural heart disease with current or previous history of heart failure so these are patients who have avert clinical findings of heart failure like shortness of breath pulmonary congestion reduced ejection fraction reduced ejection fraction and uh, they or they have a history of heart failure in the past uh, for which they have been treated and they might have be they might have been under compensation or they may be decompensated stage d of course is uh, the red flag advanced heart failure marked heart failure symptoms that interfere with daily activities like just walking around in the house doing dishes or even moving from room to room so despite maximum guidelines directed medical therapy one of the things i would like to mention here before i go any further is uh, that basically we have two types of heart failures which we will be touching upon in a minute but i wanted to show it through this diagram we have the dilated congestive heart failure or cardiomyopathy then we have the hypertrophic diastolic dysfunction heart failure to sum up here in this beautiful chart stage 1 it talks about pre risk heart failure this is pre heart failure but uh, they may have some degree of uh, abnormalities and of course stage 3 and 4 which are consistent with patients with heart failure and symptoms and of course stage 4 is kind of a, a for advanced heart failure Now let's switch gears and look at it from a different perspective. We looked at the symptomatology, we looked at their structural changes in the heart and maybe some biomarkers on hemodynamic changes as uh, it was evident on the like echocardiography or Doppler studies. Now let's look at uh, based upon 
the left ventricular ejection fraction as an independent factor for determining the type of heart failure, which is a very, very important uh, parameter that we use on a daily basis when we are dealing with heart failure patients. Of course, you're all very familiar with uh, HEF-REF and HEP-F. HEP-REF is with a reduced ejection fraction, less than 40%. And these patients may have plus minus 40% ejection fraction or they may have greater than 40% ejection fraction. Anything below 50 is considered as a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Then we have an intermediate group which was introduced uh, in this uh, ACC AHA 2022 heart failure guidelines. The heart failure with uh, mildly reduced ejection fraction. That is a group which has an ejection fraction between 41 and 49%. And of course, uh, this should go into the, the bottom column. But anyway, if you have a patient with a heart, left ventricular ejection fraction of 41 to 49%, uh, that uh, should not be interpreted as normal because uh, that is abnormal and uh, that is an early sign of a decompensating heart. And that is particularly true in patients uh, with hypertension or aortic stenosis who are supposed to have 60 to 75 percent ejection fraction. And by the time they even get to 55 ejection fraction, to me, their ventricles are already decompensating and not able to keep up with the vascular resistance against which the ventricle has to pump. Now, finally, we have the third group, which is with a preserved ejection fraction. This is the hypertensive, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy type of group with the left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, elevated end diastolic pressure, which is prone for acute pulmonary edemas, and they resolve very quickly also with the diuretics. And this is the group which has a normal ejection fraction, assuming 50 is normal, but for a hypertensive patient, I would think 50 is sort of low. I mean, that's my opinion. Anyway, so in this group, we can have, uh, so we have, I don't know why they put all these things, but basically HEP F is the group which has a preserved ejection fraction, but still they have diastolic dysfunction, whereas with the HEP REF, the reduced ejection fraction is related to the systolic dysfunction of the left ventricle, which is dilated, which is flappy, which has increased diastolic volume, and the stroke volume, even if it's increased, is uh, proportionately much lower than what is needed to maintain the cardiac output. How do we evaluate these patients? Basically, we take a clinical history, we do the physical examination, EKG, measure BNP, and of course, echocardiography is going to be quite useful in pinpointing what we are dealing with. Uh, and uh, that will show us about uh, le the left ventricular size, left ventricular wall thickness, the systolic function, the diastolic function, the left atrial size, and any evidence of valve regurgitations and evidence of a diastolic dysfunction through the mitral uh, pulse Doppler. And we can also look for any other factors that may be associated, wall motion abnormalities, pericardial effusion, or uh, aortic disease, or aortic valve stenosis, things uh, of that nature. So this is, uh, how, this is how we evaluate a patient for uh, structural changes. And now we're going to switch gears and look at the third parameter that was used, but this is one which was the first one originally used in classifying heart failure. That is the New York Heart Association class one, class two, class three, and class four. New York Heart Association class one is no symptom, no limitation of physical activity. Ordinary physical activities does not cause any symptoms. So no symptoms at ordinary physical activities. So routine, going to work, coming back home, doing some work in the garden, no symptoms, that's stage one. Number two, slight limitation in physical activity. You know, with more than ordinary work, like if you are trying to jog, you may have symptoms or shortness of breath, fatigue or palpitations. Slight limitation in activity, stage two. Stage three is marked limitation in physical activity. 
just doing routine house uh, work going to work or working in the house or just uh, even playing with the kids you may be having symptoms that is the stage 3 heart failure and stage 4 is of course uh, that uh, you are seriously limited with your activities you can hardly get around the house you can hardly walk to the mailbox uh, and you could be symptomatic even at rest uh, without doing any physical activities so this is based upon the symptomatology and of course it is also based on the ejection fraction because as the patient's condition goes from stage 1 to stage 4 there is progressive deterioration in the left ventricular ejection fraction and as a matter of fact the patients with uh, now class 1 may have normal ejection fraction class 3 patients may have ejection fractions in the range of 20 25 percent and I have seen many patients in class 4 heart failure with ejection fractions like 7, 10, 15, 18 percent ejection fractions. So those are things that we need to keep in mind. <clears throat> of course that applies to the congestive heart failure type of uh, heart failure we are talking about. If it's a diastolic heart failure they may still have a normal size ventricle. In fact, older ladies may have very small ventricles and their stroke volumes are extremely small as their diastolic dysfunction gets worse and worse, uh, their symptoms get worse uh, and in those patients uh, they may be severely limited uh, not because of the reduction in the ejection fraction but because of the diastolic dysfunction and reduction in the stroke volume related to the body's needs. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here is kind of trying to marry the stage A, B, C, D with New York Heart Association classification. And uh, I think sometimes it is important to know when you're dealing with a class 1 heart failure, does this patient have structural changes? Or if you're dealing with class 2, 3 or 4, do these patients have structural changes? And how significant are the structural changes? Are we dealing with uh, mild changes structurally or are we dealing with an end-stage heart failure like class 4 heart failure with grossly dilated cardiomyopathy, increased volume, decreased uh, <clears throat> effective stroke volume, reduced ejection fraction, dilated left atrium and many other things to go with like pulmonary hypertension and other evidence of uh, <clears throat> congestive heart failure symptoms. So class 1 sort of matches with B, class C could manifest with class uh, 2, 3 or 4 New York Heart Association patients and of course stage D is seen in much far advanced cases of uh, New York Heart Association for class heart failure patients. So there are different ways to look at the heart uh, function, structure, symptomatology, ejection fraction and overall condition in terms of activities. So ladies and gentlemen this is another slide that sort of uh, sums up the whole thing here and that is we are talking about uh, stage A, stage B, stage C and stage D and here on this side we have the New York Heart Association classification and uh, here is the established heart failure and of course stage before stage 1, we have high risk group of patients who are prone to develop heart failure in the future, who have some underlying conditions. Stage 1 corresponds to B with structural changes in the heart, previous myocardial infarction, little hypertrophied ventricle, wall motion abnormalities or valvular heart disease and of course stage 2 and 3 sort of uh, go with class C structural changes and class 4 of course goes with the D marked changes in the structure of the heart there's a lot of fibrosis dilatation and uh, wall motion abnormalities reduced ejection fraction increased elevated end diastolic pressure left atrial enlargement and all these factors that go together so ladies and gentlemen here is a composite chart I just put this one in because this chart is extremely useful for a clinician you may want to just pause this make a copy of this chart and put it on your bulletin board because it tells you about the various New York Heart Association classification at the top 
and we have the various structural changes on the slide here and it tells you what kind of treatment we start these patients on depending upon whether they are in stage 1 or stage so stage A, stage B or class 3 heart failure. So these are all different options available. This is like a, a complete comprehensive overview, a bird's eye view of uh, heart failure classifications based on their structure, based on their function, based on their symptomatology and what options are available at various stages. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this quick presentation on classification of heart failure. It is always confusing when they give a question about combining stages of a New York Heart Association classification with the stages related to the structural deformities and trying to make some sense. I hope this has been able to help you with that classification. And I will see you in the next presentation. Before I go, I just want to tell you, I have a series of presentations uh, on ACC AHA guidelines on many topics uh, in the field of cardiology. And please uh, look up that playlist and watch all those videos. And I will see you in the next presentation. Thank you so much for your time.